on the air tonight with a verdict we have never seen before. Why a jury has now found the mother of a school shooter guilty of manslaughter. The precedent this historic case sets and what it all means for the shooter's father, whose case goes to trial soon. Then to another courtroom and another historic decision. This one, a big blow in one of the many legal fights for former President Donald Trump. The case that's now one step closer to a jury as his legal team races to try to stop the clock. We're live with that breakdown just ahead. And the new evidence the NTSB says it has on that terrifying moment a door plug blew out of a plane in midair. Why it all seems to spell more bad news for Boeing. Plus, in tonight's original, the unlikely hero in a terrifying carjacking. How an eight-year-old girl saved herself and her younger sister coming up. Then the frustration building over the nationwide drug shortage saga that doesn't look like it's ending anytime soon. The legs some families have to go through to help their kids with ADHD. That's a little bit later on in the show. Hey there, I'm ha hey there, I'm Hallie, and we begin in Michigan, where a jury is making an unprecedented decision to hold the mother of a school shooter accountable for the deaths of four students killed by her son. And what one victim's parent tells our Maggie Vespa is not just a major relief, but a big milestone. I thought that they would come back with not guilty. Really? Just because, for obvious reasons, I'm a bit cynical of uh, humanity right now. This is a major first step, yes. Um, th this was one of the hardest first steps. Here's the courtroom. And on the left, you see Jennifer Crumbly there. She's the one at the end of the table closing her eyes as she hears she's been convicted of four counts of involuntary manslaughter. One count for each of the students who were killed. You see them here, Hannah St. Juliana, Tate Muir, Madison Baldwin, and Justin Schilling. This is the first time we've ever seen something like this in this country. So how do we get here? Over the course of this case, prosecutors again and again put Crumbly's parenting on trial, making the case it was her duty to stop her 15-year-old son from hurting others. They said she failed to secure the gun, failed to secure the ammo in their home, and that she didn't get the help her son needed for his mental health. So what is next? Crumbly's husband, the shooter's father, is also going to trial next month on the same charges. We're going to break all of it down with Adrian Broaddus out in Pontiac, Michigan, where this all happened late today. NBC News Now legal analyst Angela Senadella is also joining us for the legal perspective. Adrian, let me start with you first. The reaction here to this historic verdict and some of the stunning moments we've seen in court over the past week. Yeah, some of those stunning moments is likely what led to this guilty verdict. All four counts of involuntary manslaughter. And you asked that question, Hallie, how did we get here? Prosecutors argued it is what Jennifer Crumbly did not do in the days before the shooting, even on the day of the shooting, that got us here. You talked about prosecution's argument in their case they made. They said Jennifer Crumbly had the option to take her son home. She didn't do that. Members of this jury found her guilty on all four counts of involuntary manslaughter because of her inaction. They were talking about gross negligence. The members of this jury believe Jennifer Crumbly's actions or her inaction is what led to the deaths of those four students. Not only did she not take Ethan Crumbly home on the day of the shooting, prosecutors argued she failed to listen to her son's pleas for help. The prosecution introduced a 22-page journal. In it, there were written notes with Ethan Crumbly pleading for help. He wanted to see a therapist, and he said because his parents would not listen, and I'm paraphrasing here, that he would shoot up the school. But for parents who watch this trial and who have lived with this pain for the last two and a half years, today was a day of exhale. Listen in. Without the accountability, there is no change. And that is what, I mean, myself and the rest of the families are after, is to get first that accountability and drive the change. It's not a matter of if this is going to happen again. It's when it's going to happen. And no, I mean, I, people need to wake up and take action. And that is the father of the youngest victim who was killed back in 2021. His daughter, Hannah, was only 14. Hallie. Adrian brought us live for us there in Pontiac. Adrian, thank you. Let me bring in now our legal analyst, Angela Senadella. We heard from the jury forewoman today outside court in a very brief video that one of our producers shot on a cell phone. Let me play a little bit of that. It was very difficult. It wasn't an easy decision. Um, lives hung in the balance and we, we took that very seriously. The thing that really hammered it home is that she was the last adult with the gun. 
you can hear the seriousness, obviously, with which this jury debated the fate of Jennifer Crumbly in this unprecedented verdict here. Crumbly's husband is now going to trial next month. What should his defense team be looking at here, right? What, what, what should we be looking at as far as any insight this trial gives us to the next one? Look, Hallie, his defense team should be trying to get a plea if there is any on the table here, because this is extremely bad news for him. They should also be attempting to change venue here, but that is a high bar to clear, and it's unlikely that they will be able to do that. But his team is going to just have to continue to hammer down on the fact that these causal links don't lead to one another, that whatever they knew or should have known wasn't directly responsible for these deaths. And I believe that the defense team here for Jennifer Crumbly did leave some room here, and they didn't really hammer down that if you know your child has mental illness, then that means automatically they will shoot up a school. So there's legal issues here that his team should address, but it looks like the cards are really stacked against him. Angela Senadella, thank you very much for that analysis. We'll be watching, of course, for any new reaction we get throughout the course of the night. Thank you. But we've got to get to another developing story first and a historic decision, another one. A big blow to former President Donald Trump. Turns out he's not immune to criminal charges for what he did as president, according to a new court ruling, because, and this is the key phrase, you see it here, the former president, former President Trump, has become citizen Trump. Citizen Trump, that is the critical phrase here. The court then goes on to say that Mr. Trump has all the defenses of any other criminal, criminal defendant, I should say, TLDR. Right now, he is no different than you or me or anybody else except for President Biden. We've all got the same rights. It means Donald Trump can go to trial. And the trial that would come from this ruling is arguably the most serious one he faces because it is linked to the federal charges he tried to illegally overturn the election and help spark the January 6th attack on the Capitol. Charges that carry decades of prison time if he's convicted. The Trump campaign's already promising to appeal, and they're given a preview of how Mr. Trump will try to use this whole legal issue to his advantage on the campaign trail. And that is significant, right, what happens on the campaign trail, because, by the way, if he wins the presidency this November, he might get those protections he wants, that immunity, he might get that back. We're going to talk about the politics with Von Hilliard in just a minute, but I want to start with the ruling and the legality of it here with Laura Jarrett. 57-page rule at the, that goes at the merits of the former president's argument in depth. Talk us through it. Yeah, and play-by-play, blow-by-blow, Hallie, yeah. it's a unanimous rejection of what the president was selling. And remember, if he had gotten his way on this issue, he would not be charged at all in this federal case. He would be—that would be completely off the table, completely gone. And his lawyers had essentially, I think, thrown this up as sort of a Hail Mary, hoping that it would delay things long enough. And to a certain extent, that has worked. I say to a certain extent, because the trial might still be on, it's just anybody's guess about whether could actually happen before the next election in November, Hallie, because as of right now, the trial date does not exist. Now, the former president can take this up to the Supreme Court. He doesn't like the D.C. Circuit's opinion. He says it's wrong. He says he's going he's to appeal it, and he can do that. He can go up to the Supreme Court, Hallie, but there's no guarantee that the high court actually hears the case. Well, so pull that thread, because as you point out, he has some options here. The most likely option, it seems, based on what he has said, based on what his allies are saying, is taking this up to the Supreme Court. He um, ha has this call to the court saying to save presidential immunity. That's what he claims. He says presidents need to do that to do their job. Does he have any other options, Laura, or is that really the big one here? No, they've really boxed him in, Hallie. And, okay. and the way they've done that is by saying, you have until February 12th. If you want to appeal this to the Supreme Court, you can do that, but you can't drag your feet. Because normally, he'd have like 90 days to get an appeal together. And this, they're doing at lightning speed for the very reasons that we've been talking about. They know the calendar just as well as, they, as we do. And so they're saying, if you want to appeal, you can do that, but you have until Monday to go ask them to put pause on what we've just done. And if you don't do it by Monday, it's game on for that trial in D.C., Hallie. Okay, so we're six days away from that date. Let's talk about the calendar more broadly because... It's a lot, as you well know, as our, <laughs> as our legal correspondent here. He's got, he's got till Monday to decide what he wants to do here. We're looking ahead to February 8th. That's this Thursday when he's yeah. got these ballot eligibility case arguments in front of the court. And then people can see it here. This hush money trial is supposed to start end of March. Federal classified documents trial is supposed to start end of May. I mean, it's all kind of coming to a head in the next few months here. 
It is, but just so our audience can understand sort of like where the action really yes. is, I think the, the, the thing that's happening in Washington in front of the Supreme Court on Thursday is huge because there they could decide whether he's even eligible to be on the ballot at all. And it, we'll see how that actually plays out. There are lots of complicated arguments in that, but that's something to really watch carefully because the court could come back very quickly because remember, Colorado is supposed to go ahead on Super Tuesday, so we might actually see a ruling before March on that case in front of the Supreme Court. And then on the hush money case, Hallie, I, we've talked about this before, but that's the case that might actually go first for any number of different reasons, the way he's managed to delay these other cases. The case here in New York City on the hush money, it's a state case. It's a lot, right. of, a lot of legal experts had sort of trashed that case, but it might be the one that actually goes first. Laura Jarrett, lots to follow for you. Thank you very much. Glad you're here with us. Vaughn Hilliard has lots to follow as well. He's live in Las Vegas, where there's a primary happening, as our viewers know about, caucus later in the week. That's when it counts for delegates. But talk us through the point counterpoints of the politics here. Because on the one hand, we know that the former president has tried to use these legal issues to his advantage with Republican voters. And that's been working, just straight up. People, Republicans who support Donald Trump, respond to this idea that he's being unfairly persecuted, as he continues to say. Right. But we have a new poll at NBC out today showing six in 10 voters when you look at the general electorate, right? November is what we're talking about. They do have some problems with the former president's legal issues here. Absolutely. And in a head-to-head -head matchup, Joe Biden versus Donald Trump, right now, nationally, in a popular vote, uh, Donald Trump has a five-point lead over Joe Biden. But in that same poll, when we ask folks if anything would change if Donald Trump had a criminal felony conviction next to his name, the answer was yes. It was a seven-point swing. Suddenly, you had Joe Biden up by two percentage points over Donald Trump. And so that is where, yes, among a Republican primary electorate, he has seen boost in his polling numbers over the course of the entire last year and of course to the point that he has almost wrapped up this nomination he's going to be leaving nevada with delegates the question though comes to the general election and ultimately some of those independents turned off here by the criminal trials that are pending for him i want to let you listen to one voter though who suggested that donald trump may not be the only martyr when it comes to what he amounts to a questionable political persecution he's not the only criminal in washington dc there's plenty of them. He rubs people the wrong way, me including, but you know, there's just, there's just a lot of people that are doing the same exact thing that he's been doing. And it's those types of voters, Hallie, that are going to be at the heart of this 2024 presidential election if it is, in fact, Donald Trump versus Joe Biden. Because as you heard her say, yes, Donald Trump rubs her the wrong way, but also feels some sympathy for what he's enduring. Of course, it will ultimately be juries that determine his guilt in each of these four criminal trials, though, Hallie. So... What is your expectation for what we're going to hear from the former president? Because he's going to be out doing these rallies. We know that it's not just Nevada. He's obviously looking ahead to South Carolina and then Super Tuesday, end of this month, right. early next. It would not even be surprising a little bit to hear him talk about this on the campaign trail this weekend, right? No, he doesn't run away from this on the campaign trail at all. He talks about the nuances of each of these cases and the makeup of the courts, including the Supreme Court. And he is trying to almost build out a defense team of Americans so that they go back into their families, their churches, their kids' schools, and they can help share the legal defense that he's making. And he does that from the campaign stage. He also does it on his social media account. You know, he has repeatedly over the last hours posted about that a president should have uh, executive privilege or a presidential immunity, I should say, rather. And so for Halley, this is also a fundraising effort. He has sent out a text message from his campaign this afternoon to his supporters trying to gain funds already over the course of the last year. More than $50 million was transferred from uh, his affiliated political super PACs over to uh, be used for legal expenses. So for Donald Trump, this is just about, about, as much about the political it is as it is about the legal. Vaughn Hilliard, live for us there in Vegas. Vaughn, thank you. Let's bring it back here to Washington, because late today, in just the last few hours, some new details here on the investigation into why that door plug just blew off an Alaska Airlines plane. In this preliminary report, there's this picture, photo evidence. It didn't have any bolts in it. It wasn't bolted in, apparently, before that door plug terrifying moment, midair moment, happened. Take a look at this picture. There's three areas without bolts where they should have been. This report is coming as the head of the FAA is telling lawmakers he's going to step up oversight of Boeing and increase how many in-person inspectors are watching the company. Listen. There have been issues in the past, 
and they don't seem to be getting resolved. So we feel like we need to have a heightened level of oversight. Going forward, we will have more boots on the ground, closely scrutinizing and monitoring production and manufacturing activities. I want to bring in NBC's Tom Costello, who's following this story for us. And Tom, this is a dramatic detail, a dramatic uh, piece of the mystery on this door plug that you broke today on the air as we're getting some new information about this preliminary report. Explain yeah. how this could have happened. This is the NTSB's 19-page report. I've looked at a lot of NP NTSB reports yeah. over the years. This is preliminary, not a final report. But it's very, very uh, involved and detailed. And that photograph you showed is critical because the NTSB is saying that right there, they've circled where three of four door plugs, I'm sorry, bolts should be in that door plug. They're gone. They're not there. The fourth one should be underneath the insulation that you see that's hanging low. It may also be gone. In fact, when they looked at the recovered door plug, remember it fell out of the plane right. and was in a Found teacher's backyard. backyard yeah. They did metallurgy tests on that recovered door plug. Those tests suggest there were never bolts in that door plug. But wait a second. How does a plane get to taxi down a runway and take off with people on board yeah. with, with bolts missing where they yeah. should otherwise be? I think that's exactly what the NTSB wants to know and the FAA. To be clear, that, that door plug, that photograph was taken at a Boeing production center. Not Alaska. It had just come off the assembly line. They had taken the door plug off to make a fix. Then they put it back on, but apparently they didn't bolt it in place. Then they sold the plane to Alaska. It takes off. And uh, six weeks after they bought the plane, the door plug explodes out the side of the plane. Does this suggest, or do we have any indications to suggest that this was a one-off, somebody's sort of isolated mess up, or that this was something more systemic that was happening at this production Yes facility? and yes. Uh, so it yes, in that this probably was a one-off. One case in which workers went in because they found bad rivets they needed to fix one time. However, Spirit Aerosystems, as you know, the provider of the fuselage, they have had so many problems. They just misdrilled 50 holes on, on airplanes across the spectrum. They've left bolts in the rudder. They've had problems. Literally, Spirit has had so many quality control mm. issues, and they are the critical provider for Boeing, and Boeing's got problems uh, as well. So what is the onus on the FAA here? When the FAA comes out and says and testifies, you know, we're going to try to step up oversight of Boeing, more in-person inspectors, et cetera, yeah. what does that actually practically translate to? Uh, first, can I show you the Boeing statement? Because legal and standards is going to want me to make sure that we get Boeing say, because Boeing is saying the following. The CEO is saying uh, Boeing, uh, in fact, is accountable for mm -hmm. what happened, according to uh, the company. It says, uh, and an event like this must not happen on an airplane that leaves our factory, and it will not happen again. The the FAA has got to get their inspectors on the ground. Mm. There aren't enough of them. By the way, there's a deputized program where they actually give the authority to Boeing to police itself. Hello, that's not working. That's the fox guarding the hen house. And so now they're talking about maybe we need an outside group, a third party to come in and also help out. Tom Costello, we're so glad to have you on a big aviation story like this. Thank you for that breakdown. Appreciate it. My pleasure. It. Let's take you out west because tonight California is trying to start to recover after that huge and deadly storm triggered nearly 400 mudslides. Hundreds of mudslides, according to the latest numbers. It was L.A.'s 10th wettest day ever these past 24 hours. People... Dealing with it now, quite literally trying to pick up the pieces of their lives, doing it as the wind gusts hit 65 miles an hour in some spots, with the rain still coming down even today in some places. More than 120,000 people do not have power. Tens of millions are under these flood alerts. You see some of the damage here. L.A.'s mayor says California is going to face years of recovery from what is a storm that has now made history. Sam Brock is joining us now live on the ground in Napa, California. So, OK, Sam, fine. Worst may be over. That's a good thing. The question is, what happens here next after uh, something that, that L.A., California, this state hasn't seen in a long time? Isn't it amazing, Hallie, that this rain is still going on after record-shattering numbers in Southern California? That system, it's a little spottier now, but their totals in L.A., for example, seven and a half inches of rain. That's an entire year's worth of rainfall in two days. And some parts, like Bel Air at elevation, are looking at a foot plus of rain. That's down south. Out here, what's going on on the ground? Thousands of people still with no power. Look over my shoulder. These are the PG&E crews right now trying to restore those power lines. A lot of them are falling off into the middle of the street. You have insurance adjusters and, of course, 
fallen trees, arborists and crews trying to remove them. This is a redwood, probably about 100 years old, just snapped in half. In fact, the street that I'm standing on right now, this is Franklin Street, is known as the Street of Trees because of all of these gorgeous redwoods. And yet, one tree on this entire street snapped off and fell, not just into a car here. This is one man's pickup truck, and thankfully, he is okay. But take a step with me for a second. The house just over my shoulder has the Roscoe's in it. Jane Roscoe and her granddaughter, Layla. She was spending the night because she wanted to sleep over with Grandma. Originally, she was going to be Layla in the guest room. That, however, didn't work out because she wanted to be a little bit closer. So instead, the room that she ends up in has a couch next to the bedroom. The tree that you're looking at over my shoulder splits the difference between Grandma and granddaughter. These images now show what the viewpoint was from her couch looking out at a gaping hole in the wall. Hallie, if she had been positioned, the six-year-old girl, in one direction or another, she could have died. But thankfully, it went right down the middle, and everybody is okay. We spoke with Jane Roscoe about how this really worked out in a mysterious way for her family, just the vagaries of how this all plays out. Here's what she said. The way that um, the tree fell, it was, um, it was jarring right in between, you know, the, the living room and the bedroom where I was. And then the ceiling tiles came down in my in the bedroom and everything was dust and murky. And it was all dark, of course, because there was no no power. So we couldn't really see the enormity of it until daylight. They're lucky, obviously, to have their lives across the state right now of California. Hallie, 140,000 customers still with no power. But that number has come down considerably from where it was just 24 hours ago when we last spoke. It gives you chills to hear that story, Sam, and to see those images and to think about for the uh, several families who were not so lucky as to be able to avoid those close calls. Um, Sam Brock, live for us there in Napa. Thank you so much. It's good to see you. Let's bring it back here to Capitol Hill because in just the next hour, we are likely going to see what could be a history-making vote, probably a razor-thin margin in the House of Representatives on whether or not to impeach a cabinet secretary, the Homeland Security Secretary. House Republicans say Alejandro Mayorkas isn't doing his job trying to solve the crisis at the southern border. So they're moving to impeach him. If this passes, it's going to be the first time in 150 years we've seen something like this. If it passes, and at this hour, that is still a question mark. Nobody's really sure if House Republicans have enough votes to do it. Even if they do, by the way, it then goes to the Senate. It's DOA there in all likelihood. It's all happening as we're seeing this kind of split screen here, because on the Senate side, there's this billion dollar bill to overhaul the U.S. immigration system that is slipping away. In fact, you could probably say it in the past tense. It has slipped, at least according to Senate leadership there on the Republican side. By our count here at NBC, more than half of Senate Republicans say they're not going to vote for this thing. They're sending negotiators essentially back to the drawing board in what is a defeat for some of those lead negotiators who worked on it, including Senator James Lankford. President Biden today is calling out those Republicans who won't vote for it, saying this flip-flopping, saying you wanted some border policies and voting against it, comes down to politics. For years, they said they want to secure the border. Now they have the strongest border bill this country has ever seen. We're seeing statements about how many oppose the bill now. Republicans have to decide, who do they serve? Donald Trump or the American people? The president adding that Republicans should show some spine against former President Trump, who has bashed this plan. NBC's Morgan Chesky is covering this from on the ground in Eagle Pass, Texas, right near the border with Mexico. We've laid out, Morgan, the politics of the policy where I'm sitting from here in Washington. But give us the perspective from where you are there, where the crisis is actually happening, this humanitarian crisis at the border. Hallie, I think politics is the one part of this ongoing debate that nobody here in Eagle Pass wants to talk about because that's been the name of the game for so long. And what hasn't happened is a clear solution for uh, one community along the entire U.S.-Mexico border that perhaps has felt the biggest brunt of these record-breaking surges uh, that happened this past fall. We have seen, of course, a dip in these migrant crossings in January uh, and anecdotally here in February so far, but that doesn't have anyone convinced that the numbers will stay down uh, whenever the weather improves, as this is kind of a seasonal dip in migration. We've had a chance to speak to a lot of the folks in this community, Hallie, who have had their lives changed uh, really 
starting about a year ago when these numbers started to tick up. And in every aspect of this community, you see a, a shift in lifestyle as a result uh, of what's happened here. I want you to hear what a former mayor of Eagle Pass had to say uh, regarding what's going on in Washington uh, and how it relates to this border community of about 30,000 people. Take a listen. I think it's a great start. I think we need to get it through. If the Republicans really wanted a solution, they would sit down at the table. Instead of just spending money and making noise the way they're doing it, we should sit down at the table and resolve this issue. Uh, now, as for whether or not anything will be solved, as you mentioned, Hallie, that has yet to be seen. But keep in mind some of the numbers here. 70,000 migrants arrested in the Del Rio sector, which includes Eagle Pass, in the month of December. That was that record-breaking month that along the entire border resulted in a quarter million migrant arrests by Border Patrol. One key point here, Hallie, is that whenever they do have to surge resources and shut down one of the bridges here in Eagle Pass, that is essentially taking money from the dollars this community, uh, this budget, this community relies on. We spoke to uh, the fire chief yesterday. Their budget is tied to tolls that are paid when anyone goes back and forth across these bridges. When those are closed down to surge officers and agents elsewhere, they're missing out on funds that this entire community benefits from. Do real quickly, I want to share with you, uh, despite the uncertain nature of this bill in Washington, uh, the Border Patrol Workers Union has weighed in on it. And here's what they have to say, despite the political back and forth. They say the Border Act of 2024 will give U.S. Border Patrol agents authorities codified in law what we have not had in the past. And while not perfect, the bill is a step in the right direction and is far better than the current status quo. For everyone here in Eagle Pass, Hallie, the status quo is something they're becoming all too familiar with. Back to you. Morgan Chesky, live for us there in Eagle Pass. We're glad to have you there along the border, Morgan. Appreciate it. Let's take you overseas because right now the Secretary of State is in the Middle East trying to pull together support for a ceasefire deal in Gaza that so far Hamas is responding positively to, according to the Qatari Prime Minister, Tony Blinken striking a little bit of a new optimistic note, saying he's going to take the proposal now to Israel tomorrow. So could this be the deal to stop the fighting and get more hostages out? Could this be the moment that something like this actually goes through? When I was last in the region a few weeks ago, uh, I said then that there's a very powerful path uh, that we can see before us to actually get to lasting peace and security. And it's coming ever more sharply into focus. All of it's coming as we're just learning that a fifth of the hostages believed to still be in Gaza, held by Hamas, 31 people, they're believed to be dead, according to internal Israeli military documents. And in the face of this new hope for maybe some kind of peace, or at least a moment for peace, Israel is now turning its military campaign to the Gaza's southernmost city. The defense minister is calling Hamas's last remaining stronghold, his words. I want to bring in Raf Sanchez, who's live for us here in Tel Aviv, where the Secretary of State, Raf, has just touched down. What else do we know about this ceasefire framework? Could this be the one to actually stick and maybe go through? You and I have talked before over the course of the last month or so about some of these frameworks coming together. What's the prognosis here? So many, many stops and starts, Hallie, yeah. as you know. This deal remains very much a work in progress. The secretary's mm. motorcade actually just went past our live position here in Tel Aviv. He has a very busy day meeting with Israeli Prime Minister Benjamin Netanyahu and other officials. Just rewinding for a second for our viewers. Ten days ago, CIA Director Bill Burns is in Paris with officials from Qatar, Egypt and Israel. They sit down, they hammer out this broad framework of a deal to pause the fighting in Gaza, get more humanitarian aid to Palestinian civilians and release some of those hundred plus hostages still being held. It is only tonight that we got a response from Hamas to that framework. They are not definitively saying yes or no, but they are saying they want changes to that framework. We don't know exactly what those changes are, but they repeated demands they have made consistently in recent weeks, which is that any deal that leads to the release of hostages must also lead to an end to the war in Gaza, which is something Prime Minister Netanyahu, under intense pressure from the far right of his cabinet, has said he will not agree to. 
Now, we heard Halley from President Biden at the White House a short time ago. He said some of Hamas's demands are, quote, a little over the top. We don't know exactly what he meant by that, whether it's the demand that the war ends or whether it is the number of Palestinian prisoners that Hamas is demanding be released from Israeli jails as part of this deal. But the Secretary of State, on his fifth visit to the region, trying to close those gaps and trying to get this deal over the line. Hallie. Raf Sanchez live for us there in Tel Aviv. And as you say, Raf, uh, the Secretary of State is going to hit the ground running first thing tomorrow morning where you are. Appreciate it. Coming up, more news from overseas because Prince Harry is just arriving in the UK after his father's cancer diagnosis. What we know about the reunion between the prince and the king and who's going to assume public duties. Plus, why Honda is now recalling hundreds of thousands of cars, maybe even yours. So tonight's original now with in-depth reporting on a topic we've been watching. And tonight it is a terrifying carjacking near Milwaukee that turned out an unlikely hero. The eight-year-old girl stuck in the back seat when everything went wrong. Here's Maura Barrett. A routine stop at a Wisconsin quick trip turning into a nightmare. Someone just stole my car on 27th Street with my two kids in the car. But an eight-year-old girl's quick thinking. I was scared. I was like, what's happening? Saving her and her sister after a shocking carjacking. I was really just about an arm's length away from my car. Adam Jorgensen says he went to grab a cloth to dry off his vehicle after a car wash when someone asked him for directions. Then suddenly... I heard the screeching of our tires. The car was gone with his daughters, two-year-old Autumn and eight-year-old Charlie, in the back seat. He told me to get out of the car. I was like, oh, what should I do? Should I run and be a scary cat or should I save my sister too? Charlie telling our affiliate WTMJ she knew her dad had the keys, not the carjackers, and she decided to stay put. The driver ditched the car and the kids at the Batteries Plus store about a mile down the road. And Charlie acted fast, her little sister panicking. grabbing her dad's phone from the front of the car and calling her mom, leaving this message. Mom, I need you. Do we love dad? Their dad back at Quick Trip frantically on the phone with police. We are over by Batteries Plus, and then an officer's going to come over and meet you at the Quick Trip, okay? All right, but you guys have my kids. The incident reflecting a bigger trend in carjackings, rising 17% from 2022 to 2023 in nearby Milwaukee. And nationally, carjacking's up 93 percent from 2019 to 2023, according to a new Council on Criminal Justice report, tracking rates across 10 U.S. cities. Back in Oak Creek, the police department said it took three suspects into custody and it's seeking felony charges this week. Now, a family reunited. I ran as fast as I could out of the back of that cop car to hug them. Hoping others will learn how quickly things can go wrong. Remember you won't bother drying your car? <laughs> ah, yes, we'll dry the car at home now as well. Yep. <laughs> I'm obsessed with this little girl and her family. I mean, what, what is so striking, I think anybody listening to that, hears the fear in the dad's voice as he is calling about his kids in the backseat of a car. What else? I mean, you make, I think, the point more in that piece that we, on carjackings and how scary those can be. Are we hearing anything else from officials there about this particular incident? Well, I mean, you've got to say that little girl, definitely not a scaredy cat. <laughs> she said she was scared oh, of being no. because that quick call, right, really made such a difference. The Oak Street Police also telling us that the father's <laughs> calm and collected 911 call actually had everything that they needed uh, to locate and arrest those three suspects within 48 hours. Remember, those suspects uh, will be uh, are facing multiple felony charges. Police say that they're grateful that everyone is safe and reunited, uh, calling this a horrific crime. But they say that they are building what they're saying is a strong case for the district attorney. They say they're confident that justice will be served, Hallie. Maura Barrett, thank you so much. Let's get you over to the five things our team thinks you should know about tonight. Number one, so much new reaction coming in today after the death of country music icon Toby Keith. He died yesterday from stomach cancer. We're hearing today from stars like Billy Ray Cyrus, Carrie Underwood, Reba McIntyre, hosting tributes to the singer. The Country Music Hall of Fame and Museum calling Toby Keith big and brash, saying he never bowed down or slowed down for anyone. He was 62 years old. Number two, more than 130 people are now believed to be dead in those wildfires in Chile, and those numbers are expected to go up. Hundreds more people are still missing. 
Officials say the fires seem to be burning themselves out at this point. This is said to be the country's deadliest disaster since an earthquake more than 20 years ago, or in 2010, I should say. Number three, Honda is recalling hundreds of thousands of cars, 750,000, because of an airbag defect. Basically, a faulty sensor could cause the passenger seat airbags to go off unintentionally. This applies to pilots, Accords, Civics, and CRVs from the last couple of model years, 2020 to 2022. Take it to a dealership if you have one. More info online. Honda says there have been no reports of anybody getting hurt yet, fortunately. Number four, Meta plans to start labeling AI-generated images on Facebook and Instagram. Those will start to pop up, the company says, in the coming months, so some point relatively soon, citing the number of elections happening this year around the world. The feature is not going to work yet for any video or audio that's made with AI, however. Number five, Red Bull says it's looking into the head of its championship F1 racing team, Christian Horner. The company says they've commissioned an independent investigation. They wouldn't get into why, but according to the AP, Horner's accused of misconduct toward a team employee, something he denies. When we come back, a lot more to get to, including how firefighters ended up trapped inside their own truck. Plus, a pilot making an emergency landing on a busy Florida road. We'll show you what happened. Look at that. NBC News covers hundreds of stories every day. And because it can be tough to read or watch or listen to them all, our bureau teams have done it for you. This is what they tell us is going down in their regions in a segment we call The Local. Out of our Midwest Bureau, a hospital in Chicago says it's trying to get its computer systems back online after a cyber attack. This is the Lurie Children's Hospital, which says the outage is making it harder, obviously, to communicate, and it's limiting access to some medical records. But the hospital is still open. It's had to cancel or reschedule some elective procedures. They're looking into what all this is about. Out of our Southern Bureau, look at this. Check out this video of a plane. Looking like it's coming in for a landing on that road. Turns out that's exactly what it's doing, making a landing on that busy road. You can see it flying close to cars before it touches down safely, incredibly. Two pilots were inside the cockpit. Both got out without getting hurt. Officials think this was an engine issue. That was the problem that forced the pilots to land, but they're still looking into it. Also out of our Southern Bureau, officials in Texas say two firefighters are seriously hurt and in the hospital tonight after their fire truck flipped over. They'd been responding to a house fire when the truck lost control and rolled. Four firefighters were in the truck when it happened. The other two are expected to be okay. Officials think the driver probably lost control, but they're still investigating. Prince Harry, now back home in the UK to see his father just 24 hours after the King's cancer diagnosis was made public. We're going to show you here his car pulling into Buckingham Palace right there. And just before it, we got our first sighting of the king and his wife in these new photos you're about to see since his diagnosis was made public. It comes as, There's those photos there. You see him waving with a smile. We're learning that the king's other son, Prince William, of course, the heir to the throne, is prepping to take on more of the public heavy lifting for his father, who's putting off his public duties for now. All of it is the prime minister reveals King Charles' cancer was, in his words, caught early, and even though the king is revealing more about his health than a lot of his predecessors, still a lot of questions and a lot of speculation about what kind of cancer the king has and what treatment will look like. Josh Letterman is outside Buckingham Palace and joins us now. So there's a lot to this here. And let's start with the sons, right? Specifically, Prince Harry rushing back home within just days of this cancer diagnosis becoming public. What does that say, especially considering the uh, difficult relationship that the two have had over the last couple of years? Well, it certainly indicates that this is serious, given that it was less than 24 hours, as you point out, Hallie, uh, that Prince Harry made it back here uh, to London for what we believe is the first time he's actually been face to face with his father since the coronation last year. And the fact that the palace is being so tight lipped about the details is certainly giving way to a lot of that speculation uh, that you were talking about. But there are a few signs, even in the tea leaves that the palace is putting forward, that suggests that this is not as dire as potentially it could be. First of all, the fact that the king is receiving outpatient treatment, meaning right now there are no indications that he's going to need to go under anesthesia for some type of major surgery. Second of all, the fact that as of now, the palace has not indicated that any counselors of state would be appointed. These are essentially people who could stand in for the official duties of the king, like signing off on new laws if he were to be expected to be incapacitated. And so uh, all indications are that he is 
is going to be able to still carry out those formal duties, and that is giving some optimism uh, that there may be a pathway back to health for him, including those comments from Prime Minister Rishi Sudak that you mentioned, suggesting uh, that the cancer was caught early. But interestingly, the palace saying today that those comments from the prime minister were not revealing anything new. They were simply pointing back to a statement the palace issued yesterday where they say that the king was glad that his doctors and his medical team had acted so swiftly, Hallie. Okay, you've laid out sort of the, the case to be made here uh, and, and the, the, the landscape of what's happening with the king and his sons. There's this paradox, and I want you to pull on this thread a little bit more, because on the one hand, the king has revealed more information, or at least the palace has revealed more information than arguably they have in, in past instances when royals have yeah. become sick. On the other hand, that is fueling so much of what I think you are probably seeing in the UK, from what I understand, and you'll tell me, which is speculation, right? Speculation about what is happening. Um, you know, it's it's... What has occurred? Uh, as the New York Times put it, it's almost like opening the medical curtain, but only halfway here. And one of the ironies here, Hallie, is that Buckingham Palace is making very clear they don't want people publicly speculating uh, about exactly the nature of what kind of cancer, the prognosis, everything else. They're saying, look, we're going to put out the information that we're going to put out, and you should go with that and nothing more. But the fact is there are millions and millions of people uh, around the world in the United States, certainly here in the U.K. and throughout the Commonwealth, that care very deeply about the monarchy. They are concerned about the king. Uh, and as soon as you mention a cancer, Cancer diagnosis, which they did yesterday, uh, people understandably get very concerned. And so uh, we can be sure that uh, until the palace is able, uh, hopefully, to release information suggesting that the king has uh, healed and recovered, people are going to continue to speculate even as they wish him well. Josh Letterman live for us there at Buckingham Palace. Josh, thank you so much. Coming up, we are getting some new details just into us tonight about that long-awaited report by the special counsel looking into how President Biden handled classified documents. The new reporting from our team coming up in just a second. Plus, confusion and conspiracies and accusations of cheating. We're taking you inside an election denial group in our backstory in just a minute. So it is primary day in Nevada, and as we explained on this show 24 hours ago, that's pretty much only symbolic for Republicans in that state, since it's Thursday's caucuses that count for GOP delegates. That might be an explanation why turnout so far seems pretty low, according to some new numbers in from Nevada's Secretary of State. It's still early, of course, in Nevada. We'll watch that. But it all brings us to tonight's backstory, our behind-the-scenes look at how a story comes together and how it fits into our bigger picture. And tonight, it's what happened on the last primary day in New Hampshire and an inside look at the growing problem of election denialism. Wired Magazine followed the New Hampshire Voter Integrity Group on Facebook during the primary there two weeks ago. It's reporters' findings, to sum it up, conspiracies, confusion, and outrage. Within minutes of polls opening, Wired reports, some of these Facebook group members were convinced that there was fraud, even without any evidence, with members writing, corruption already starting, another saying, always cheating. Again, nothing to back that up. And on election day, the group's founder tasked them, again, primary day in New Hampshire, the group was tasked with doing things like demanding information from poll workers, logging any discrepancies they see, monitoring polling site check-ins. NBC News has reached out to Meta, the parent company, of course, of Facebook, for comment on this group. No response yet. David Gilbert is the reporter for Wired who is tracking all of it. David, thank you for being on the show. We're so glad to have you. Thanks for having me. Of course. So your beat over at Wired is this space of disinformation, of online extremism. I know that this is a group it seems like you've had your eye on for a while now. How did you find them initially? Why did you focus on them? Um, I suppose they came to my attention along with dozens of other groups in the aftermath of the 2020 election. They first set up, I think, in February 2021, um, and they came across my radar sometime in the months after that. They would have been part of kind of a national wave of state-specific groups who were set up uh, um, under the belief that the 2020 election was stolen. Um, and each of the state groups would have had very specific reasons why they thought that the election was stolen in their state. Um, but over the years, it's grown very big and it's become part of this kind of mass network of similar groups across the country that now push the the lie that the 2020 election was stolen. 
Talk about that, what you describe here, David, as that mass network, if you will, because it can be, I'm sure, um, a lot to keep track of. Talk about how you keep tabs on these groups. And, and the piece of it um, is it relates to these conspiracies popping up on, on critical days like primary day with no evidence to back them up. Yeah, so as I said, in early 2021, these groups popped up and initially people kind of dismissed them. But over the course of the last two or three years, they've really solidified, they've grown to thousands and tens of thousands in some cases. And there's there's both state-specific groups like this one that I was investigating on primary day, and then there's national groups that kind of knit them all together um, with figures that, um, you know, transcend these groups and they often refer to the very very similar figures um and people who they believe are kind of leaders of their movement the disinformation mm. movement from the election 2020 and so it can be quite hard to keep on top of every one but i track them across different platforms this one's on facebook it's a private group so i was able to gain access to it a number of them are on facebook um, some of them have been kicked off Facebook, so they've moved to Telegram. So there's there's quite a lot of them on Telegram, dozens of them on Telegram. And then most recently, the most kind of interesting update in the last kind of six months is that a lot of these groups have now moved to Substack. Because they've got large followings, they're trying to get their followers to move there mm. and monetize that and, and earn money um, from spreading these conspiracies. And so when Election Day comes around, these groups have thousands of very active, very engaged followers. And as I, was, as I saw in this group on, in New Hampshire, they were posting continuously throughout the day and posting such a wide variety of conspiracies that pretty much everything they saw, they believed there was something nefarious about it, even though there was a very um, basic and trustworthy explanation for what happened. Your, your point on the attempt to essentially try to monetize some of this election denialism is interesting here because when you cover disinformation and online extremism, you're looking at how these things impact people. You're based in Ireland, so you're covering these issues not just here where we are in the U.S., but on a global level. So I'd appreciate your perspective of stepping back when you look at the bigger picture here. How have you seen this issue evolve, this issue of election denialism around the world? Um, it's, it's quite interesting, actually, because I think the U.S. is unique in certain respects because it has kind of created this ecosystem of effectively what are election denial grifters who are looking to monetize the interest because a huge proportion of the population there has come to believe that the election was stolen. Um, in other parts of the world, it's quite different. What we've seen or what I've seen in the course of my reporting is that the the people who are taking advantage are traditionally people who are in charge. So we've seen authoritarian governments across the, the world who have leveraged Facebook, Instagram, Twitter, or whatever other social platforms are popular in those countries and weaponized them against their own people. Well, David Gilbert, we're so glad to have you laying this out for us here on the show. Uh, I know you have a lot of fans here at this show uh, with your reporting there at Wired. Thank you very much for being with us. Appreciate it. Still to come, growing frustration over the years-long ADHD drug shortage with doctors and patients still struggling to get these medications, fed up and asking who's to blame. We're getting into it. New and growing frustration right now over this nationwide shortage of key ADHD medicine with one mom telling our medical team how her family has to sometimes ration the doses she gives to her son because they're afraid of running out. Listen. We really try to focus on giving it to him for school and then ease up on the weekends, um, mostly to um, preserve, because we don't know if we're gonna have to go without it again. Patients and families telling our team they're having to hunt around to find a pharmacy to fill their prescriptions, only to be told that these key drugs like Adderall are on back order. And this is a big problem because more than 6 million kids and nearly 9 million adults in this country have been diagnosed with ADHD. Dr. Akshay Sayal is joining us now. A lot of finger pointing, it seems, going on here between drug makers, between uh, some enforcement agencies here. W what's going on? W what's the issue and how do we solve it? Yeah, Hallie, it seems like we've been talking about this for a while. And just yeah. for some background here for your viewers here. So when this first came about, I think there was a lot of, um, as you said, finger pointing, a lot of people saying, you know, during the pandemic, people were getting Adderall through telemedicine, through doctors they weren't seeing in person. And, you know, that demand was really overwhelming people. And I think, Hallie, as time has gone on, as some of the smoke has cleared a little bit, 
What we're seeing is a, really a finger pointing game here between the DEA, the Drug Enforcement Agency, and all the manufacturers. Essentially, the manufacturers are saying that the DEA is not giving them enough allocation to produce the drugs they need to, and the DEA is saying, actually, we are. You're just not making them. And so we're in kind of this standstill right now where people are sort of pointing fingers at each other. And, and you know, I, I say that not to scare people, but for everyone watching out there, for those who have ADHD, for, for parents like you just heard of, of Wendy there, of kids with ADHD, it's really important to be aware if you have an Adderall prescription refill coming up, uh, you don't want to delay that because you don't want to be in a situation where you have to go without your medication, Hallie. Let me play a little bit more from the mom that we just showed you, who, by the way, also takes ADHD medication, um, and she kind of lays out her struggles here. It used to be where I would try to fill it um, at the, my same pharmacy, and it was uh, would be days and days and days of kind of getting the runaround of going, well, we're supposed to get another shipment tomorrow. We'll call you tomorrow. And then that shipment comes in and there, there's, there's, you know, no supply. It's just a pain. It is a burden for people who have other things going on in their lives, right? Other mental labor that they've got to carry as well. What is some advice that you might give to patients who are trying to navigate some of the shortage? You know, it's it's not a it's not an easy situation, Hallie. And we spoke to, to families um, like Wendy, like you just heard from, and, and also others who are telling us, you know, things like doctors are having to rewrite their prescriptions. Uh, patients mm -hmm. are having to try, you know, if instead of Adderall, they're trying other stimulants like like Vyvanse or Ritalin, um, or they're even having to call pharmacies all day. And if you've ever called a pharmacy, you know, it's a very yeah. very cumbersome process to even get a hold of one pharmacist. Imagine having to do that a dozen times. So I think just be prepared, Hallie. And I, again, I don't want to scare people. Just be prepared. If you have a refill coming up, you want to act as soon as you can. Dr. Akshay Sayal, it's great to have you breaking that down for us. Thank you very much. That Anytime. does it for us for this hour. We've got more coverage picking up right now. coming on the air tonight with a verdict we have never seen before. Why a jury has found the mother of a school shooter guilty of manslaughter. The president, this historic case sets, and what it all means for the shooter's father, whose case goes to trial soon. We've got a breakdown coming up. Plus, the new evidence the NTSB says it has on that terrifying moment a door plug blew out of a plane in midair. Why it all seems to spell more bad news for Boeing. Then, some breaking news just coming into us tonight on when we could see that special counsel report over classified documents found a president in Biden's home. We're going live to the White House in just a minute. We'll also take you live to Capitol Hill, where the House is set to take up what could be a vote that makes history to impeach a cabinet secretary over the crisis at the southern border. So what are the chances it happens? Plus, our exclusive one-on-one -on -one with all-time great, the Olympic gymnast Gabby Douglas. She's got a big announcement to make. She's going to do it right here later on in the show. Do not miss that. Hey there, I'm Hallie, and we start tonight in Michigan, where a jury is making an unprecedented decision to hold the mother of a school shooter accountable for the deaths of four students killed by her son. And what one victim's parent tells our Maggie Vespa is not just a major relief, but a big milestone. I thought that they would come back with not guilty. Really? Just because, for obvious reasons, I'm a bit cynical of... Uh, humanity right now. This is a major first step, yes. Um, th this was one of the hardest first steps. I want to show you the courtroom now. You see Jennifer Crumbly there. She's the one at the far end of the table. She's closing her eyes as she hears that she has been convicted of four counts of involuntary manslaughter, one for each of the students who were killed. You see their faces. Hannah St. Juliana, Tate Meir, Madison Baldwin, Justin Schilling. This is the first time we've ever seen a verdict like this in this country. So how did we get here? Over the course of this case, prosecutors again and again put Crumbly's parenting on trial, making the case it was her duty to stop her 15-year-old son from hurting other people. They said she failed to secure the gun, failed to secure the ammunition in their house, and didn't get the help her son needed for his mental health. So what comes next here? She'll be sentenced in a couple of months. But first, Crumbly's husband, the shooter's father, is also going to trial next month on the same charges. We'll take you live here to Pontiac, Michigan with Adrian Broadus, out where the trial happened. NBC News Now legal analyst Angela Senadella is joining us as well. Adrian, to you first. And what we're hearing tonight about this historic verdict. Now, families who were inside of the courtroom for this entire trial have been waiting to exhale. Today, they finally exhaled. Even though this is a step, they say, toward accountability, it does not take the pain away, and it doesn't erase what happened at Oxford High School 798 days ago back in 2021. We also after that the guilty verdict was read 
four counts of involuntary manslaughter. We heard from a member of the jury, the four woman. She said, and I'm paraphrasing here, this was not an easy decision. Lives hung in the balance, and we took that very seriously. So what was it for members of this jury? She said the thing that really hammered it home was the fact that she, meaning Jennifer Crumbly, was the last person with the gun, the last adult. After the verdict was read, I spoke with the father of Hannah St. Juliana. She was the youngest person killed. Here's what he had to say. Without the accountability, there is no change. And that is what, I mean, myself and the rest of the families are after is to get first that accountability and drive the change. It's not a matter of if this is gonna happen again, it's when it's gonna happen. And people need to wake up and take action. And the prosecution's job was to prove that Jennifer Crumbly was grossly negligent and didn't act with ordinary care, meaning her inactions didn't prevent the deaths of those four students. Hallie. Adrian brought us. Thank you very much. Let me bring in Angela Senadella now. So, Angela, what do you think it is? I mean, you heard from uh, from Adrian there what seemed to be the tipping point for the jury here. The four women showed up today outside court. Our producer got to interview her briefly on a cell phone camera. Let me play some of that. It was very difficult. It wasn't an easy decision. Um, lives hung in the balance, and we, we took that very seriously. The thing that really hammered it home is that she was the last adult with the gun. You, you hear in her voice and in her words how seriously the jury seemed to take this year. It is potentially precedent-setting, right? What does that mean? How do you see the historic nature of this trial and what it means specifically for Jennifer Crumbly's husband, James, who's going on trial next month? So it means really bad things for James Crumbly because it arguably he has even more legal culpability here. He is alleged to be the person who actually purchased the gun through this straw man deal for his son. And according to Jennifer Crumbly's testimony, he is also allegedly the one who is responsible for storing the gun and may have failed there. So his trial is likely going to end in a bad way for him if it's going to follow the way that this trial went. Now, with regards to the precedent, it is so significant, Hallie, for a lot of reasons. First of all, note that Ethan Crumbly himself was tried as an adult. He was charged as an adult and thus sentenced to life in prison without parole. Now, the precedent this sets is for parents across the country. Even if your child is an adult in the eyes of the law, you as a parent could still be held responsible for your negligence, for things that you do and you don't see. Obviously, the implications for gun storage are also huge as well. If you gift your child a gun, that is also a major red flag that can result in legal culpability. And so the significance is astounding. Angela Senadella uh, laying out the stakes for us there. Thank you very much for that tonight. Appreciate it. We've got to get to some breaking news that is just coming into us tonight because the Justice Department is apparently set to issue its special counsel report soon on the classified documents found at President Biden's home and office. This is according to a senior law enforcement official familiar with the matter. To be clear, criminal charges are not expected here, but I want to bring in Kelly O'Donnell, who's posted up near the White House, to break down the significance of this and what else we're learning, Kel. Fill us in. Good evening, Hallie. This is a report by special counsel Robert Hur, and we expect it could be made public in a matter of days. And this goes back to some of the time when the current president, Joe Biden, was vice president and had some documents that ended up in his personal home in Wilmington, Delaware. The process has been many months in the making. The president and his son, Hunter, were interviewed for this probe, as were some other uh, top aides to then vice president and current president, Joe Biden. And what we expect is that this report, which is being uh, certainly will be circulated uh, and drawing a lot of criticism from Republicans, will stand out and be different than what we've seen with some of the other cases. We saw where Mike Pence had documents in his home. He turned them over quickly. There were no charges against him. We do not expect charges against Joe Biden because as the sitting president, uh, he is immune from, I uh, shouldn't use immune on the day we got the immunity thing. He, it is policy that the Department of Justice does not charge a sitting president, but they yeah. could have charged other aides. And it is our understanding that that is not happening here. But the bottom line, Hallie, is this will be 
uncomfortable for the White House because mm. having these documents in any in any way in a in a in a form that was not proper is going to raise scrutiny. It's going to be a part of the narrative of the campaign. And even though the circumstances for Donald Trump were quite different, and there is an allegation of willful retention of the documents, very different circumstances, uh, it may give Donald Trump more of a uh, a way to to try to argue that his case should be treated the same way. This is a heavy subject, certainly. It is one that is weighed on this Biden White House, yeah. and we expect that there should be some kind of resolution. And the special counsel is required to notify Congress and to make it public. So we will learn more. Hallie. As you and the rest of the team, I know, are standing by for the potential for more news soon to come. Kelly O'Donnell, thank you so much for that. We're going to get to more of that Donald Trump news Kelly was referencing in just a second. But first, in just the last few hours late today, we've learned more on why officials say a door plug blew off that Alaska Airlines plane in midair. Look at this preliminary report picture. You see those three blue circles? These officials say there were supposed to be bolts holding the door to the plane in those circles. Those bolts were missing. They were simply not there when this plane left the Boeing factory. That, obviously, an issue. Coming as the head of the FAA is telling lawmakers today he's going to step up oversight of Boeing and boost the number of inspectors in person at the company's sites. Listen. There have been issues in the past, and they don't seem to be getting resolved. So we feel like we need to have a heightened level of oversight. Going forward, we will have more boots on the ground, closely scrutinizing and monitoring production and manufacturing activities. NBC's Tom Costello is following this one for us. So explain this issue. How is it possible that a plane ends up taxiing down a runway, takes off with passengers on board yeah. with a piece of its fuselage, basically a piece of its wall, not actually bolted in? Yeah, well, that's exactly what the FAA and the NTSB want to know. And so they've now released this 19-page report, Hallie. It is very full. It is very complete. It's, and it's only preliminary, but it's painted. It shows those photographs, uh, which is pretty uh, conclusive evidence that, in fact, this plane, that photograph was taken at the Boeing Production Center before it was sold to Alaska. So they had that plane with those three bolts that were at least three, maybe four bolts missing from the door plug. And then they sold the plane to Alaska Airlines. Uh, about two months later, the plane was up in the air and it blew out. And so that's what their question is now. Why and how did that happen? Here's what Boeing says today in a statement that they've released to the media. Boeing says the following, it's accountable for what happened. An event like this must not happen on an airplane that leaves our factory. We simply must do better for our customers and their passengers. We're implementing a comprehensive plan to strengthen quality and the confidence of our stakeholders. Make no mistake about it, Boeing has lost an awful lot of goodwill on Capitol Hill at, at the FAA. Uh, and so they are fighting for the reputation, as we discussed yesterday. But now the FAA is really going to be doubling down on the audits and the, the, yeah. uh, the inspections at Boeing. But talk about that reputational piece of it for a second, Tom, because over the course of the last several years, we've seen multiple crises for Boeing, two deadly crashes, this door plug issue we're talking about, the announcement that you and I talked about this week, they may have misdrilled holes on like 50 unfinished planes. Is at this point, what needs to happen to scaffold this company, which in the eyes of some seems too big to fail? It is too big to fail. Bottom line is it's a national security company. It's a huge part of our GDP. It's one of only two major plane makers in the world. The United States cannot let Boeing fail, and there's no suggestion it will. Make no mistake mm. about it. But yeah. uh, enough airlines have now lost confidence in Boeing that Airbus is outselling Boeing, and Boeing is very much struggling for its reputation. Here's what the FAA says it's going to do right now, doubling down on safety, doubling down on inspections. However, it also says we don't have enough inspectors at the FAA, and the system in which we deputize Boeing workers to kind of be our eyes and ears, that's not working. So now the FAA is talking about maybe bringing in a third party, an outside party, to help on the inspections themselves. Tom Costello, live for us with everything we need to know on this story. As always, Tom, thank you. To another developing story now, a decision that is making history and a big blow to Donald Trump. Because turns out he is not immune to criminal charges for what he did as president, according to a new court ruling. Because, and you see the key phrase here next to me, because the court ruling says that former President Trump has become citizen Trump. That's critical, those two words, citizen Trump. This ruling goes on to say he has all the defenses of any other criminal defendant available to him. So TLDR right now, 
He's no different than like you or me or anybody else except for President Biden. We've all got the same rights. It means Donald Trump can go to trial. And the trial that would come from this ruling is arguably the most serious one he faces because it's linked to the federal charges he tried to illegally overturn the 2020 election and help spark the January 6th attack on the Capitol. These are charges that carry decades of prison time if he is convicted. Now, the Trump campaign, they are already promising to appeal, potentially all the way up to the Supreme Court. And they're given a preview of how Mr. Trump will try to use this whole legal issue to his advantage on the campaign trail. And what happens on the campaign trail is super important, because, by the way, if he wins the presidency this November, he might get those protections he wants, that immunity, he might get that back. We'll talk about the politics with Von Hilliard in just a second, but let's get into the nuts and bolts of this ruling more with Danny Savalos here. The, basically, Donald Trump now has six days to decide whether or not to appeal. All signs suggest he is going to, and that is a function of the timeline here, right? Walk us through it, because if his goal is to delay this past to the election, that could happen. His best bet is not necessarily a move to reconsider or on bank review. In other words, get all the judges from the circuit instead of mm. just the three on the panel. Uh, most likely, he'll make an emergency application to the Supreme Court on the last possible day, which is the 12th, uh, because he doesn't want to do it any sooner. He wants to take advantage of as much time as he can. The Supreme Court then could issue a stay, a stay until they decide his application or his cert uh, petition. And that could take really uh, not too long, maybe on the order of a month, maybe as short as uh, 10 days for briefs to be in. But it will result in delay. And likely as not, the Supreme Court will grant the stay. The circuit judge for this circuit is uh, Chief Justice Roberts. Uh, he will review that emergency application. And if you're betting, he's probably going to issue a stay and the Supreme Court is probably going to hear this case. He's got three. Now, listen, I think people, I think we've been, we want to be clear on what he's facing here, right? What the issue is here. This is the federal election interference issue. It is not the only legal quandary that Donald Trump finds himself in. He's got three other separate trials, which could start in March, May, and August, not to mention whenever this one gets started. What is the expectation here beyond what you've discussed here, Danny? And, and how, do you see, um, how do you see the nexus of some of these cases? The very earliest possible that this case could be heard by the Supreme Court or that briefs could be in would be the end of February. Uh, a realistic timeline might be early fall, August, September, for this case to be decided. That's if the Supreme Court uh, allows it to go that long. It's hard to estimate how the Supreme Court might limit the time in this case if they even take it up, uh, or if the case just gets sent back down uh, to the district court if, for example, uh, the Trump team moves for a different kind of relief for en banc review. It gets really, really complicated. But the bottom line is this, and I've said this for months, Hallie, uh, most of these cases are going to run smack dab up against mm. the election. And if not, they are going to come after the election. The Georgia case is probably not going to go until 2025. And I was saying that in 2023. So all these cases are in varying stages. But the general rule of thumb is just yeah. add a few extra months in a complex case. Danny Savalos, thank you so much. Von Hilliard is live for us on the campaign trail in Las Vegas, ahead of the caucuses in Nevada just a couple of days from now. Uh, we see the vote signs behind you. There's also a primary happening tonight, more significant for the Democrats here. We have seen, Vaughn, and you well know this from talking with voters in states all across the country, the Republican primary electorate, right? The people voting now to pick the Republican nominee, we know, based on polling, that they don't have too much of a problem with Donald Trump's legal issues. It is a different picture for voters overall, meaning people who would vote potentially in a general election in November, not just Republicans, right? And those are the voters, Hallie, right, that are he's going to have to start appealing to pretty quickly. Those yeah. are the general election voters. And if, in fact, he wins this Republican nomination against Nikki Haley, which he appears to be on the track to doing, it is those independents, those even Democrats, that he'll need to siphon off at least a number of votes from. And if you look at NBC News polling, uh, to the extent that voters are concerned, it's not even just Democrats and independents, but there is a share of Republican voters. You see that 27 percent that are concerned here as well. Well, and when you go back to the election of Joe Biden and Donald Trump of 2020, you saw uh, Joe Biden win independence by anywhere from 15 to 25 percent. Uh, this was a major swing in the Democrats' direction in 2024. And so for Donald Trump, the polling should be a concern because a criminal conviction, a felony conviction that's next to his name, at least according to our polling, is something that would lead voters to choose Joe Biden over Donald Trump. 
The other thing of it, too, right, is the more Donald Trump talks about his legal issues, the more money he raises in many instances. Right. Just this afternoon, a fundraising text came out from Donald Trump's campaign asking for donations because uh, they've got to take this to the U.S. Supreme Court. It said that this was an effort to undermine the MAGA movement. And so for Donald Trump, we saw in the last year alone, $50 million be moved from uh, 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 political purposes, from his affiliated super PACs, to be used for legal expenses. More than $50 million, Hallie. That's no, no, uh, no little penny here. And especially when you're talking about <laughs> mounting a president presidential campaign here. And so for folks that are looking to donate, you're donating not only just to a political effort, but also a legal one here. And as you said, and as Danny said, uh, for Donald Trump, if he were to potentially face those felony convictions by year's end, uh, it becomes ever more paramount for him to win in November in order to self-pardon himself. Vaughn Hilliard live for us there in Vegas. Vaughn, thank you. Lots to watch, I know, in the weeks ahead. Appreciate it. Let's bring it back here to Washington and take you up to Capitol Hill, because any minute now, and it hasn't started just quite yet, but any minute we are expecting to see some action on the floor with a potentially razor thin and potentially history making vote on whether or not to impeach a cabinet secretary. Something like that hasn't happened in 150 years. The cabinet secretary in question, Homeland Security Secretary Alejandro Mayorkas, because House Republicans say he hasn't been doing his job at the southern border. Question is, is it going to pass? Nobody really knows. Nobody's really sure if House Republicans have the votes to do it. Again, we will find out at some point tonight. But here's the thing. Even if they do, this impeachment then heads to the Senate, where it is almost certainly DOA with Democrats controlling that chamber. It's kind of a split screen, too, because there's this huge border bill we've been talking about, billions of dollars. It is slipping away. In fact, it kind of already has slipped away. You can use the past tense for that one. Look at this NBC count. More than half of Senate Republicans say they're not going to vote for it in its current form, essentially sending negotiators back to the drawing board. President Biden today is calling out some of those Republicans, saying this flip-flopping, first asking for a policy and then rejecting that policy, he says it comes down to politics. For years, they said they want to secure the border. Now they have the strongest border bill this country has ever seen. We're seeing statements about how many oppose the bill now. Republicans have to decide, who do they serve? Donald Trump or the American people? I want to get to NBC's Sahil Kapoor, who's posted up on the Hill covering all of this for us. We talk about that split screen. Let's start with screen number one and this impeachment, potentially, of the Homeland Security Secretary. We've got minutes to go until this vote kicks off. How confident are House Republicans they're going to be able to get this passed? Not particularly confident, Tally. I've talked to multiple House Republicans uh, in the last few hours, and none of them are really sure whether they have the votes to do this. It's definitely going to be a very close vote because Republicans have a slender majority. We've talked about this many, many times. They have only two votes they can lose unless uh, unexpected absences shift that number in one direction or another. And we already know of two House Republicans who say they intend to vote no. Let's put up a list of five key Republicans to watch here because we do expect Democrats to unify and vote against this impeachment. Several of these Republicans, Ken Buck has said he intends to vote no. Tom McClintock has said he intends to vote no. That could be the margin, Hallie. They may not be able to lose any more votes. And there are several other Republicans who are undecided. That includes Mike Gallagher. I just spoke to him a couple minutes ago as he walked onto the House uh, floor. He declined to say how he plans to vote uh, when we asked him multiple times. He simply said no comment as he walked on. Congressman Dave Joyce, another one who says, uh, you know, he's not or at least not revealing how he uh, will vote on the Mayorkas impeachment. And Patrick McHenry, the former acting speaker, not revealing uh, whether he's going to vote for Mayorkas. So it, we will wait until the final, the final minutes of this vote to see whether yeah. uh, the numbers add up, whether this can uh, ultimately pass. They need a simple majority. This is a, a project that's been driven by hard right conservatives like Marjorie Taylor Greene for a long time. It would be a very historic vote if it, uh, if it does pass. The crux of this is Republicans say Mayorkas is willfully refusing to enforce immigration law. His critics, the Democrats and the Republicans, say you can't impeach someone of our policy difference over the way uh, he's using prosecut uh, prosecutorial discretion. Uh, one way or another, if it does succeed, it would be a historic vote. Very quickly, Sahil, in like 10 seconds or less, as we talk about the other piece of the split screen, that border bill on the Senate side that seems to have slipped away. Is that it? I mean, stick a fork in it, it's done? This border bill has no pulse, Hallie. Uh, whether or not there is a time of death pronounced, uh, I'll leave it to others to do that, but it would require a miracle to resuscitate it. Uh, Republicans in the last 48 hours, within 48 hours of its release, have, have put so many knives in it, I don't see how it can survive at this point.
extremely clear. Saha Kapoor, thank you for the vivid imagery. Appreciate it. Uh, I know a long night ahead of you, potentially there on the Hill. Let's take you out west because California tonight is trying to recover after that huge and deadly storm triggered nearly 400 mudslides with historic rainfall, making it LA's 10th wettest day ever. Now people are trying to deal with what is left, what they have left, literally picking up the pieces of their lives. And they're doing it as it's getting super windy with gusts of like 65 miles an hour. In some spots, the rain is still coming down. Look at this. You can see some of the aftermath here. More than 120,000 people still do not have power. Tens of millions are under flood alerts. L.A.'s mayor says the state is going to face years of recovery now from this storm. Sam Brock is live for us on the ground in Northern California in Napa. And Sam, you have been talking to people whose some of whom their lives have been changed forever. Some had these incredibly close calls, feeling lucky to have escaped this storm alive. Their lives snatched basically from the jaws of death, Hallie. And I will say right now, it's hard to believe this event, this atmospheric river is still going on. 29 million people under flood alert still right now. Southern California, Nevada, Arizona. So that's still a thing as we're assessing, as you said, the damage and picking up the pieces in places like Napa County. Consider this, Napa in the last decade has seen two generational fires, a six plus magnitude earthquake. And now this, right, a storm that was strong enough to rip trees. This is a redwood tree. Look how wide this is right here. There were folks out here counting the rings earlier today, somewhere around 95 or 100 years old, depending upon who you ask. This thing started on one side of, this, of the street, was snapped off and fell over here. Look at this. The other half of this tree is in a grandfather's truck. Thankfully, he was not in the car at the time. This happened at about 5 in the morning. He was inside of the house. Come with me for a second, and you'll see the aftermath. It actually gashed the middle of this roof and went right through the house. Look at this. Come here. Okay, the, the house is essentially split into two. Inside, you had Jane Roscoe, a grandmother who had her granddaughter Layla over for a sleepover. Layla was supposed to stay in the guest room. The guest room over there, if we look at these images right now, is totally concave. The roof came down. Layla was actually on a couch where she decided to be closer to her grandmother. The tree split the area between grandma and the bedroom and the couch, and everybody was okay. The odds of that, almost zero. And so we spoke with Jane after the fact to find out how she felt about all of these stars essentially aligning to keep everyone alive. Here's what she told me. You make decisions. You don't always know why you're making those decisions, but, you know, even for a child, the child knows, um, you know, where she's safe. And so closer to me was what, what she thought. And unfortunately, we were separated by a tree for a short period of time, but she still knows that she's safe. Matter of inches, not feet. Now, I want to show you one other thing, Hallie. Obviously, this is the tree that fell. This redwood right here did not fall, but I'm told by neighbors who walk this street all the time on Franklin, it wasn't at this angle before the storm. So now you have another tree here, and just if we can pan up for a second to show you how big this thing is, that's at about a 60-degree angle, leaning over the street. The neighbors told me an arborist came out and said, don't worry, it's not going to fall over in the next 24 hours. I don't know how reassured well, <laughs> you would feel by a statement yeah. like that, but a lot of folks out here are wondering, I mean, these trees were planted 100 years ago, not where they're indigenous to, right? They're, they're in the middle of a street. Their roots, which are supposed to bind, really can't out here. And so a lot of questions that come out of a storm like this and maybe some of the city planning as well. Well, you got to hope uh, that folks are going to be able to get the help that they need for the situations like the ones that you're describing. Sam Brock, we're glad to see you out there live in California. Thank you so much. We got a lot more to get to coming up here on the show, including a new lawsuit against Disney. Why one actress says she lost millions. Plus, our exclusive one on one with Olympic gold medalist Gabby Douglas. There she is. Hi, Gabby. The announcement she's about to make in just a sec. Now to an exclusive announcement only here on NBC News about three time Olympic gold medalist Gabby Douglas. As we are learning tonight officially that she is planning to compete at the end of this month, her first competition since 2016, when I know you remember her at the Rio Summer Olympics. We are talking about an Olympics legend here with Gabby going to the games twice and winning gold three times. She's joining us now to talk more about this all. Gabby Douglas, welcome to the show. Thank you so much for being here. Hi, thank you so much for having me. Of course. So talk about this decision. What led to this? Why now to get back into competition? 
Well, I honestly, so I'm chilling on a farm right now and I was watching the 2000 or 2022 championships. I was like, man, I like miss competing. And um, I was trying to figure out how to get like this kind of like, I'm still a competitor at heart, trying to like Mm -hmm. get this out of me. And so I decided to start back training, you know, kind of take time to myself. And then I found myself in the gym and I was like, all right, like maybe we can just do this again. And from that moment on, I just started training and I was like, wow, like I can't believe I'm in this spot again. (laughs) So Gabby, then the big question, Does this mean you have your sights set on Paris for the Olympics this summer? Oh, definitely. Most definitely. Um, I'm definitely taking one day at a time, Um, but I'm honestly like super excited to get back out there. What would that mean to you to be competing in what would be your third Olympics? It would mean a lot. You know, it's definitely a lot of hard work that I've had to put into it, but it would mean a lot. I would just love to go back out there and represent USA, you know, just one more time. And um, just to have that feeling of being a part of something, being a part of team again, would be amazing and a huge honor. When you talk about competition, right, the one later this month will be your first competition. And I know you've been training and we've been showing some of the pictures of that, but it would be your first true competition in eight years. And if you do make the Olympics, you'd be at the age of 28, the oldest American woman to compete in gymnastics since the 1950s. I wonder, Gabby, how are you thinking about the demands on you now physically and preparation-wise and training-wise for a moment like this? Honestly, I'm just super grateful for my body to be able to hold up to this sport. And I've been doing a lot of recovery, a lot of um, things with what goes into my body. And it's honestly helped me out very much. And I think, I don't know, I just, I love it. I love pushing myself to the limit. And I think when you love something and when you love your craft and you're willing to work for your craft, then it'll work for you. Will this be the one in February, your only competition before the Olympic trials? Or do you think you'll do more? What's your season looking like? No, I'm definitely going to do more. So it's Winter Cup and then a few more assignments on the side. And then it's Classics, Championships, Trials, and then off to the Olympics. Knock on wood, you got so many people rooting for you. And even the possibility, Gabby, of this moment, this announcement right here, even the possibility of that has been written about with people talking about like the Gabby Douglas comeback. Is that how you see it, Gabby? Is like a comeback for you? Yeah, I I guess it sort of is. I never really announced a retirement. I just loved, I I didn't want to end the sport how I did in 2016. I wanted to take a step back and work on myself and work on my mental state and I love gymnastics. Like I said, I love pushing myself uh, every single day, and I love the sport, so I never wanted to walk away on a bad day, and I want to make sure, and I know I've said it before, but I really want to make sure that I really give it my all and end on a a good note, and honestly, like, I'm super uh, just so grateful for everyone showing me love and support. It's really, really motivating, and I'm just super grateful. (laughs) I I mean, it's amazing to hear you talk about this because I've written, I've read some of what you've written before about wanting to find the joy again for gymnastics. Have you found it? Have you found that joy? I think I have. It's definitely a different um, mindset and a different atmosphere in this generation. And I think it's a good thing. Gymnastics has definitely a little bit changed since, you know, the previous years. And I have, I honestly love going to the gym and like I said, like getting my skills back and kind of putting stuff together. It's just very exciting. Your career has made history. You've been an inspiration for so many people, Gabby. I know you know that. What message do you hope that this moment sends now to young women or to really anybody who is watching you, who is hearing you talk about setting your sights on a dream on Paris and going for it? I would say if you truly love what you do, then go for it. Never let someone's limited view limit you and uh, go for go for the moon. Like, we, we only live once, so why not go and try it? Go for the moon, or in your case, go for the gold. Can you even think about, like, you, Simone Biles, the USA Gymnastics team, like, if it happens for the Olympics in Paris? How are you even processing that? I'm honestly taking one day at a time, and it's honestly going to be very, very crazy, but I'm going to do kind of the same procedure that I did in 2012, 2016, take one day at a time, one competition at a time, and then go from there. <laughs> And you'll be, I mean, obviously we're looking at some of these images too of you on the bars. That is your, that's your thing. I mean, you are just, no pun intended, like unparalleled when it comes to that. I, I imagine that's going to be a big, a big focus too heading into trials. Oh, for sure. Yes. Um, that's the one thing I've been spending uh, time on all four events, but a little bit more time on bars because I love it. And I just, you know what I mean? Like, uh, that's the one event in, in my opinion that I really want to, you know, kind of, not kind of, but do well on. 
I, I have a feeling you're gonna, Gabby, and there's so many people in this country <laughs> and around the world who will be rooting for you. Um, any last words of advice for people watching you? Anything that you're feeling in your heart? You're feeling nervous, you're feeling excited, all the above? I honestly am feeling excited, nervous, grateful, uh, a little bit timid, but you know, that's, I think that's normal. It's been such a long time, but like I said, I'm so excited to get back there, get back out there, be with everyone, get that kind of like competitive, kind of get my feet wet a little bit after eight years out. And then I think I'll just be a little bit, you know what I'm saying? Good to go. I totally get it. Uh, I cannot wait to watch. Well, hopefully we'll talk again at some point, Gabby, as you are on this journey that is just so incredible. People rooting for you, I know, all over the place. Gabby Douglas making some big news tonight right here on NBC News. Gabby, thank you. And if you were thank like, you I so have much. to watch Gabby, of course, if you're like, how do I watch her? February 24th, the, the Winter Cup there, USA Gymnastics YouTube channel, that's how you do it. What a great interview. What a great piece of news. And we have more news coming here in the show, too, including the five things our team thinks you should know about tonight. And former MMA fighter Gina Carano, she says she is suing Disney and Lucasfilm after getting fired from The Mandalorian. Remember when this made headlines not too long ago? She's alleging wrongful termination and discrimination. She says she got fired for putting conservative opinions out there online. She wants to get her job back, or at least $75,000 in damages. And she's got the backing of Elon Musk and X, formerly Twitter. Carano says X is helping to pay for this lawsuit. Number three, another recall for Stu Leonard's up in uh, the Connecticut tri-state area, this time for a bunch of chicken salad process products that may contain milk, but didn't say it on the label. The recall comes just weeks after a woman died from an allergic reaction from eating Stu Leonard's cookies that had peanuts and eggs in it that were also not on the label. You can bring any of the food back for a refund. Number four, Meta is planning to start labeling AI-generated images on Facebook and Instagram sometime relatively soon, with the company citing the number of elections taking place all around the world this year. The feature will not work yet for any video made with AI or any audio at this point. Number five, a Miami couple is facing charges after police say they stole more than $1,000 worth of Stanley Cups. You know the Stanley Cup. You can see their alleged haul from a Dick's Sporting Goods here. 31 cups in a bunch of different colors. When we come back, we'll take you overseas because Prince Harry, he is there in the UK tonight after his father's cancer diagnosis. Who's preparing to take on a lot of the king's public duties in just a minute? Plus, why thousands of cars ended up stuck on highways in China. Right now, the Secretary of State is in the Middle East trying to pull together support for a ceasefire deal in Gaza that Hamas seems to be responding positively to, according to the Qatari Prime Minister. This would obviously be a huge deal if it were to happen. And what's interesting is this kind of optimistic tone we're getting from Secretary Tony Blinken. He says he's going to take the proposal over to Israel tomorrow. So could this be the deal? Could this be the moment to try to stop fighting, at least for now, and get more hostages out? When I was last in the region a few weeks ago, uh, I said then that there is a very powerful path uh, that we can see before us to actually get to lasting peace and security. And it's coming ever more sharply into focus. All of it's coming as we're just learning that a fifth of the hostages in Gaza, 31 people, are believed to be dead, according to internal Israeli military documents. And even in the face of this new hope for maybe some kind of peace, at least momentarily, Israel is turning its military campaign to the southernmost city in Gaza, a city the defense minister calls Hamas's last remaining stronghold, his words. Let's bring in Raf Sanchez, who's live for us in Tel Aviv. What else do we know about this ceasefire framework? Could this be the one to actually stick and maybe go through? You and I have talked before over the course of the last month or so about some of these frameworks coming together. What's the prognosis here? So many, many stops and starts, Hallie, as you know. This deal remains very much a work in progress. The secretary's mm. motorcade actually just went past our live position here in Tel Aviv. He has a very busy day meeting with Israeli Prime Minister Benjamin Netanyahu and other officials. Just rewinding for a second for our viewers, 10 days ago, CIA Director Bill Burns is in Paris with officials from Qatar, Egypt and Israel. They sit down, they hammer out this broad framework of a deal to pause the fighting in Gaza, get more humanitarian aid to Palestinian civilians and release some of those hundred plus hostages still being held. It is only tonight 
that we got a response from Hamas to that framework. They are not definitively saying yes or no, but they are saying they want changes to that framework. We don't know exactly what those changes are, but they repeated demands they have made consistently in recent weeks, which is that any deal that leads to the release of hostages must also lead to an end to the war in Gaza, which is something Prime Minister Netanyahu, under intense pressure from the far right of his cabinet, has said he will not agree to. Now, we heard Halley from President Biden at the White House a short time ago. He said some of Hamas's demands are, quote, a little over the top. We don't know exactly what he meant by that, whether it's the demand that the war ends or whether it is the number of Palestinian prisoners that Hamas is demanding be released from Israeli jails as part of this deal. But the Secretary of State, on his fifth visit to the region, trying to close those gaps and trying to get this deal over the line. Allie. Raf Sanchez live for us there in Tel Aviv. And as you say, Raf, uh, the Secretary of State is going to hit the ground running first thing tomorrow morning where you are. Appreciate it. NBC News covers hundreds of other international stories every day. And because it can be tough to read or watch or listen to them all, our teams around the world have done it for you. Here's some of what they're watching in a segment we call The Global. Out of Kenya, a court has charged the leader of a doomsday cult and dozens of his associates with the murder of nearly 200 children. All those charged deny the allegations. Prosecutors say this cult leader ordered hundreds of his followers to starve themselves and their children to death so that they would go to heaven before the end of the world. Out of India, at least 11 people are dead. More than 100 others hurt after a huge explosion at a fireworks factory. Firefighters and other first responders had worked to try to get there. I mean, look at this. You can even see some of it still going off. They tried to get there to people trapped inside the debris. The prime minister of India says the government plans to give $2,400 to the families of those who died and $600 to those hurt in the explosion. And out of China, take a look at this. Snow and freezing rain trapping thousands of cars on highways right during the Lunar New Year holiday travel rush. A whole bunch of flights and trains have been canceled or delayed because of how icy it is. So you can imagine there's a ton of people, look at that, stuck for a very long time. Millions of people traveled during the New Year, which starts on Friday. It is the biggest mass migration period in the world. Also happening internationally, Prince Harry is now back home in the UK to see his father, the king just 24 hours after the cancer diagnosis of the king was made public. I want to show you his car. This is it, pulling into Buckingham Palace right there. Prince Harry heading home. We got our first sighting of the king and his wife and some new photos we're about to show you. You see it here. The first picture since the diagnosis was made public. You see the king smiling, waving. It comes as we're learning that his other son, Prince William, is prepping to take on more of the public heavy lifting for his father, who's putting off some of his public duties. All of it, as the prime minister reveals, King Charles's cancer was, in his words, caught early. And even though the king is sharing more about his health than a lot of his predecessors, there's still a lot of questions and a lot of speculation about the type of cancer the king has, what treatment could look like. Josh Letterman is live outside Buckingham Palace for us. He's joining us now. So there's a lot to this here. And let's start with the sons, right? Specifically, Prince Harry rushing back home within just days of this cancer diagnosis becoming public. What does that say, especially considering the uh, difficult relationship that the two have had over the last couple of years. Well, it certainly indicates that this is serious, given that it was less than 24 hours, as you point out, Hallie, uh, that Prince Harry made it back here uh, to London for what we believe is the first time he's actually been face to face with his father since the coronation last year. And the fact that the palace is being so tight lipped about the details is certainly giving way to a lot of that speculation uh, that you were talking about. But there are a few signs, even in the tea leaves that the palace is putting forward, that suggests that this is not as dire as potentially it could be. First of all, the fact that the king is receiving outpatient treatment, meaning right now there are no indications that he's going to need to go under anesthesia for some type of major surgery. Second of all, the fact that as of now, the palace has not indicated that any counselors of state would be appointed. These are essentially people who could stand in for the official duties of the king, like signing off on new laws if he were to be expected to be incapacitated. And so uh, all indications are that he is 
is going to be able to still carry out those formal duties. And that is giving some optimism uh, that there may be a pathway back to health for him, including those comments from Prime Minister Rishi Sudak that you mentioned, suggesting uh, that the cancer was caught early. But interestingly, the palace saying today that those comments from the prime minister were not revealing anything new. They were simply pointing back to a statement the palace issued yesterday where they say that the king was glad that his doctors and his medical team had acted so swiftly, Hallie. Okay, you've laid out sort of the, the case to be made here uh, and, and the, the, the landscape of what's happening with the king and his sons. There's this paradox, and I want you to pull on this thread a little bit more, because on the one hand, the king has revealed more information, or at least the palace has revealed more information than arguably they have in, in past instances when royals have yeah. become sick. On the other hand, that is fueling so much of what I think you are probably seeing in the UK, from what I understand, and you'll tell me, which is speculation, right? Speculation about what is happening. Um, you know, it's it's what has occurred. Uh, as the New York Times put it, it's almost like opening the medical curtain, but only halfway here. And one of the ironies here, Hallie, is that Buckingham Palace is making very clear they don't want people publicly speculating uh, about exactly the nature of what kind of cancer, the prognosis, everything else. They're saying, look, we're going to put out the information that we're going to put out, and you should go with that and nothing more. But the fact is there are millions and millions of people uh, around the world in the United States, certainly here in the U.K. and throughout the Commonwealth, that care very deeply about the monarchy. They are concerned about the king. Uh, and as soon as you mention a cancer, or diagnosis, which they did yesterday, uh, people understandably get very concerned. And so uh, we can be sure that uh, until the palace is able, uh, hopefully, to release information suggesting that the king has uh, healed and recovered, people are going to continue to speculate even as they wish him well. Josh Letterman live for us there at Buckingham Palace. Josh, thank you so much. When we come back, the unlikely hero in a terrifying carjacking. How an eight-year-old girl saved herself and her younger sister in our original tonight. So tonight's original now with in-depth reporting on a topic we've been watching. And tonight it is a terrifying carjacking near Milwaukee that turned out an unlikely hero. The eight-year-old girl stuck in the back seat when everything went wrong. Here's Maura Barrett. A routine stop at a Wisconsin quick trip turning into a nightmare. Someone just stole my car on 27th Street with my two kids in the car. But an eight-year-old girl's quick thinking. I was scared. I was like, what's happening? Saving her and her sister after a shocking carjacking. I was really just about an arm's length away from my car. Adam Jorgensen says he went to grab a cloth to dry off his vehicle after a car wash when someone asked him for directions. Then suddenly, I heard the screeching of our tires. The car was gone with his daughters, two year old Autumn and eight year old Charlie, in the back seat. He told me to get out of the car. I was like, oh, what should I do? Should I run and be a scaredy cat or should I save my sister too? Charlie telling our affiliate WTMJ she knew her dad had the keys, not the carjackers, and she decided to stay put. The driver ditched the car and the kids at the Batteries Plus store about a mile down the road. And Charlie acted fast, her little sister panicking. grabbing her dad's phone from the front of the car and calling her mom, leaving this message. Mom, I need you. We love dad. Their dad back at Quick Trip frantically on the phone with police. We are over by Batteries Plus, and then an officer is going to come over and meet you at the Quick Trip, okay? All right, but you guys have my kids. The incident reflecting a bigger trend in carjackings, rising 17% from 2022 to 2023 in nearby Milwaukee. And nationally, carjacking's up 93 percent from 2019 to 2023, according to a new Council on Criminal Justice report, tracking rates across 10 U.S. cities. Back in Oak Creek, the police department said it took three suspects into custody and it's seeking felony charges this week. Now, a family reunited. I ran as fast as I could out of the back of that cop car to hug them. Hoping others will learn how quickly things can go wrong. Remember you won't bother drying your car? <laughs> ah, yes, we'll dry the car at home now as well. Yep. <laughs> I'm obsessed with this little girl and her family. I mean, what, what is so striking, I think anybody listening to that, hears the fear in the dad's voice as he is calling about his kids in the backseat of a car. What else? I mean, you make, I think, the point more in that piece that we, on carjackings and how scary those can be. Are we hearing anything else from officials there about this particular incident? 
Well, I mean, you've got to say that little girl, definitely not a scaredy cat. <laughs> she said she was scared oh, of being because that quick call, right, really made such a difference. The Oak Street Police also telling us that the father's <laughs> calm and collected 911 call actually had everything that they needed uh, to locate and arrest those three suspects within 48 hours. Remember, those suspects uh, will be uh, are facing multiple felony charges. Police say that they're grateful that everyone is safe and reunited, uh, calling this a horrific crime. But they say that they are building what they're saying is a strong case for the district attorney. They say they're confident that justice will be served, Hallie. Maura Barrett, thank you so much. Still to come, growing frustration over the years-long ADHD drug shortage with doctors and patients still struggling to get these medications, fed up and asking who's to blame. We're getting into it. New and growing frustration right now over this nationwide shortage of key ADHD medicine, with one mom telling our medical team how her family has to sometimes ration the doses she gives to her son because they're afraid of running out. Listen. We really try to focus on giving it to him for school and then ease up on the weekends, um, mostly to um, preserve, because we don't know if we're going to have to go without it again. Patients and families telling our team they're having to hunt around to find a pharmacy to fill their prescriptions, only to be told that these key drugs like Adderall are on back order. And this is a big problem because more than 6 million kids and nearly 9 million adults in this country have been diagnosed with ADHD. Dr. Akshay Sayal is joining us now. A lot of finger pointing, it seems, going on here between drug makers, between uh, some enforcement agencies here. W what's going on? W what's the issue and how do we solve it? Yeah, Hallie, it seems like we've been talking about this for a while. And just yeah. for some background here for your viewers here. So when this first came about, I think there was a lot of, um, as you said, finger pointing, a lot of people saying, you know, during the pandemic, people were getting Adderall through telemedicine, through doctors they weren't seeing in person. And, you know, that demand was really overwhelming people. And I think, Hallie, as time has gone on, as some of the smoke has cleared a little bit, what we're seeing is a, really a finger pointing game here between the DEA, the Drug Enforcement Agency, and all the manufacturers. Essentially, the manufacturers are saying that the DEA is not giving them enough allocation to produce the drug they need to and the DEA is saying actually we are you're just not making them and so we're in kind of this standstill right now where people are sort of pointing fingers at each other and, and you know I, I say that not to scare people but for everyone watching out there for those who have ADHD for, for parents like you just heard of, of Wendy there of kids with ADHD it's really important to be aware if you have an Adderall prescription refill coming up uh, you don't want to delay that because you don't want to be in a situation where you have to go without your medication Hallie. Let me play a little bit more from the mom that we just showed you, who, by the way, also takes ADHD medication, um, and she kind of lays out her struggles here. It used to be where I would try to fill it um, at the, my same pharmacy, and it was uh, would be days and days and days of kind of getting the runaround of going, well, we're supposed to get another shipment tomorrow. We'll call you tomorrow, and then that shipment comes in, and there, there's, there's, you know, no supply. It's just a pain. It is a burden for people who have other things going on in their lives, right? Other mental labor that they've got to carry as well. What is some advice that you might give to patients who are trying to navigate some of the shortage? You know, it's it's not a it's not an easy situation, Hallie. And we spoke to, to families um, like Wendy, like you just heard from, and, and also others who are telling us, you know, things like doctors are having to rewrite their prescriptions. Uh, patients mm -hmm. are having to try, you know, if instead of Adderall, they're trying other stimulants like like Vyvanse or Ritalin, um, or they're even having to call pharmacies all day. And if you've ever called a pharmacy, you know, it's a very yeah. very cumbersome process to even get a hold of one pharmacist. Imagine having to do that a dozen times. So I think just be prepared, Hallie. And I, again, I don't want to scare people. Just be prepared. If you have a refill coming up, you want to act as soon as you can. Dr. Akshay Sayal, it's great to have you breaking that down for us. Thank you very much. That Anytime. does it for us for this hour. We've got more coverage picking up right now. Thanks for watching. Stay updated about breaking news and top stories on the NBC News app or follow us on social media.